Thank you so much, Steve, for that introduction. And thank you so much to the organizers, to Lisa and Steve, for inviting me here. And Lisa mentioned there was a team of women behind this, as always, in the English and Sociology Department. So I thank them for supporting our ability to travel here. Thank you to Carrie Claire for all the work that she did. And thank you so much. It's such an honor to be on this panel with you women. It's really moving and emotional to be here with you today. I've been watching the struggle of Muskrat Falls unfold from a distance for a really long time. This is my first time on the territory, and I'm just really, really honored to be here. So thank you for having me. I'm also really struck by the relationships and the way that they intertwine here. Just from the short time that I've been here, it's been really inspirational to see the alliances that have built around this struggle. So I'm going to take that home with me as well. I'm also really glad to be here because I've been thinking for a long time, as Steve mentioned, about the colonial history or the, the colonial nature of the political economy of Canada, in particular in the past few years, thinking about hydroelectricity and its role in colonization. And only in the past few months, though, have I really started to look more closely um, at the damage that's been done, but also the incredible forms of Indigenous resistance that have mitigated against these disasters. And, you know, as a side note, um, the way that I've been thinking about Muskrat Dam as well as in my analysis of Justin Trudeau's rights and recognition framework. So I think as a very broad context, the moment of so-called reconciliation that we're in at the moment really needs to be examined in light of projects like Muskrat Dam. So for example, the new legislation that's coming out, Bill C C69, the proposed legislation on the Environmental Assessment Act, now called the Impact Assessment Act, if you look at what the government is proposing, there isn't a single mention of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People or the clause of free prior to informed consent in that. And I think that signals strongly when you drill into the details of what Trudeau means when he talks about reconciliation, which is basically a cultural gesture of public crying um, and asking for forgiveness of, of, from Indigenous people while continue, continuing to exacerbate the harms and the violence of colonization. So I just want to mention that today. So my work is really broadly about the political economy of colonization and the way that the state seeks to secure its hold on um, infrastructure and on the circulation of capital. And I was thinking about this just the other day in relation to this idea of stolen land. I was teaching about uh, John A. McDonald and showing screenshots of how his statue has been um, vandalized across the country. And one of the spray painted graffiti slogans said, you know, murderer, colonizer, um, stolen land. And I was thinking, you know, the difference between Canada being stolen land and other kinds of stolen objects like bicycles or paintings that can be found in a basement is that land here is hidden in plain sight. And so the way that land is dispossessed here is through rendering land inaccessible in a variety of ways to Indigenous people. And one of those ways is through the physical construction of infrastructure like the history of railroads and pipelines and hydroelectricity and cities and towns. But there are also invisible ways that land becomes inaccessible to indigenous people, like a kind of dense overlay of institutional authorities creating these impossible barriers for indigenous people, such as provincial regulatory regimes, federal policies like the land claims policy, permits and licenses granted to resource companies, international trade laws that protect capital. And all of these sort of what invisible to the public eye, all of these invisible forms of barriers become incredibly clear the moment that people trespass against these lines. And that's where you see incarceration, arrest, intimidation, and pacification of resistors, including and first and foremost and historically indigenous peoples. And most of the time, these visible and invisible forms of theft are happening simultaneously and interdependently. So this story of infrastructure like railroads and dams intersects with colonial policies of subjugation, like residential schools or reserve containment, which is very much the story of excuse me, of Canada, 
because the amount of space between oceans in this country that colonial officials sought to settle to build a viable economy has required enormous circuits of reliable trade routes and communication, as Harold Innes so long ago taught us. And that has required both the physical violence, but also policies of subjugation and pacification and um, incarceration. This resource-based economy, though, is not a thing of the past. Canada is still very much a land-based economy. As Howlett, Ramesh, and Pearl write, much of Canada's manufacturing base consists of processing resource-based commodities such as lumber, pulp and paper, and various mineral and oil-based products, and I would add hydroelectricity. In all, resource and resource-based activities generate as much as 50 cents out of every dollar pr produced in this country. And I would add that I'm doing just some early research with my colleague, Dr. Troy Cochran, where we're also looking at how the so-called big five, the major banks in Canada, are heavily exposed to natural resources that ties in financial institutions with governments in terms of facilitating this focus on resource, um, the resource economy. Canada's problem, though, <coughs> as has been mentioned, is that it continues to sell lands that it does not own. And to claim this authority based on, not really legality, but on principles of naked exploitation and greed, almost like malware in a computer that eats away at our society. And I wanna add here too, that a lot of focus on capitalist development really focuses on the protagonists of class war. But capitalist development in Canada, I think we really need to look at the way that indigenous people and the way that resistance has been mounted not through a class war, but through a strong responsibility and commitment to indigenous laws and political orders that are what create the barriers to that kind of naked exploitation. But it's not just a class war. Class development is shaped by the forces of kinship networks and alliances and solidarities and forms of life that very much counter the kind of um, resource extraction regimes that provinces promote. So today, <coughs> um, I'm interested in talking a bit about the colonial nature of energy production in Canada, which I think so far has only been really told in pieces or sector by sector. In terms of hydroelectricity, uh, about a quarter of the energy generated in Canada comes from hydroelectric power in some provinces and territories. That figure is as high as 90%, such as in Ontario, Newfoundland and Labrador, Quebec, Yukon, and British Columbia. Most of the big dams in Canada were built between the 1930s and the 1980s, a sign of high modernism, um, where big engineering mega projects transform nature into reserves for consumption. <coughs> Canada's process was largely decentralized and demand-driven compared to the New Deal planning and employment scheme in the U.S., but also the dams here began much earlier in the 1800s. They were also a fundamental part of settlement in this country. The advantages of hydro, of course, is that it's sold as a clean energy source where there's a big payout and the energy is renewable. So for politicians, it's always been tempting. But while many have studied the environmental history of Canada, only recently has the intersection of indigenous peoples, water and industrialization been a focus of study for scholars, sometimes call this hydraulic imperialism, which they define as the colonial aspirations of the Canadian state in the process of marginalizing the First Nations, and I would add Métis and Inuit people, through the manipulation of hydrological and hydraulic resources. For example, Treaty 9 in Northern Ontario was about many things, but clearly hydro and power were among them. As historians have shown, the Ontario government clearly stipulated that sites along waterways suitable for the development of hydroelectric power exceeding 500 horsepower should not be included within the boundaries of First Nations reserves. Then when Bourassa became the liberal leader in 1970, he immediately focused on damming the James Bay Rivers. In part, he was showing his might after the FLQ crisis, but when he held a huge um, rally, in, appropriately in a hockey stadium, I feel like two very Canadian things, hockey stadium and announcing damming, um, he promised, quote, that he would meet the challenge, the conquest of Northern Quebec, its rushing spectacular rivers, its lakes so immense they are veritable inland seas, its forests of coniferous trees, 
The whole country, the whole history rather, of Quebec must be rewritten, he said. Our ancestors' courage and will must live again in the 20th century. Quebec must occupy its territory. It must conquer James Bay. We have decided the time has come. So here you can see again this capitulate, recapitulation of nationalism and settlement through this very colonial approach to both the, the nature that lies there in reserve for the taking, but also reproduces this, this kind of terra nullius, this land where no one lives that the um, brave frontiersmen will conquer. In Manitoba, Shoal Lake 40, a First Nation located about 130 kilometers east of Winnipeg is on a peninsula and construction of Winnipeg's aqueduct in 1919 cut the community off from the mainland, effectively making it into an island, accessible only by boat in the summer and by ice road in the winter. Despite being a sacrifice zone essentially for Winnipeg's drinking water, Shoal Lake 40 has been under drinking water advisories since 1998. The lack of the all season road access made it prohibitively expensive for the community to build a water treatment plant. And Manitoba Hydro in general and Man uh, Manitoba Hydro in general has been uh, a huge force of colonization in terms of flooding <coughs> northern Manitoba communities in order to produce um, hydro for uh, export. Hydro isn't just a product that supplies energy to Canadian citizens or for export. It also has really powered industrialization in Canada. For example, in northern BC, towns would spring up that were fueled or powered rather by hydroelectricity that became major lumber towns that um, created a whole um, labor economy um, in rural British Columbia. In 30 years, for example, the town of Mackenzie grew from a town of 300 to 6,500 people, where 60% of the labor force worked in forestry producing wood products, valued at $540 million a year, and contributing $100 million to federal and provincial coffers. So of course, this is a complicated labor question as well, and the uh, jobs offered to people in the resource industry and these boom and bust economies has been critical for non-Indigenous communities and <laughs> Indigenous communities where in the cases where they've been included, but are also for politicians as a boom in terms of offering employment and accruing these resource revenues. But also though, it's important to note that we also have the most amazing consultation process in Canadian history undertaken regarding energy infrastructure and Indigenous people, which was the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry led by John Berger in the mid-1970s, and Berger really did things differently. He took an entire year to fundraise enough money to undertake a proper consultation with Indigenous people. He offered to meet with anyone for as long as they wanted and to listen to them talk about their concerns. <coughs> Excuse me. He would go to ceremonies. He would go to elders' homes and sit with them. And he also consulted in southern cities, raising awareness about the issue and getting the country invested in this question. In fact, when the first volume of the Berger Inquiry came out, it was a national bestseller. The failures to do these kinds of consultations also has abundant uh, results in terms of financial and investment risk that governments incur. And we have two new precedents that really show this to be true. And one is the recent precedent set by the Yamatoon First Nation in Northern Ontario. And the second, of course, is the Trans Mountain decision that found that inadequate consultation with indigenous peoples led to uh, the court to decide to quash the approval for the Trans Mountain project, which is also one of these huge me mega projects that cost into the billions of dollars. So governments must not only evaluate the environmental risk of projects through regulatory bodies like the National Ener Energy Board and the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, but they must also appreciate, and they're beginning to, the legal risks of doing business on Indigenous lands. And in my own research, doing access to information requests and looking at the risk analysis that Indian Affairs does, I found that legal risk is not only emphasized, but also the forms of mitigation are, chief among which is the objective 
to transform assertions of rights into capture within policy frameworks. And Indian Affairs has a very interesting euphemism for this called a non-rights-based approach. That's what they call the policy framework, which is a very, very interesting euphemism because in a sense it's ignoring the legal precedents that protect Aboriginal and treaty rights as the preferred policy framework for Indian Affairs, the non-rights-based approach. So the problem is the rights of indigenous people, but it also remains the geography of indigenous lands. The colonial strategy behind the geographic dispersion of reserve lands was to weaken indigenous economies and land defense. This was also the strategy for the disenfranchisement of indigenous women from their communities through the Indian Act that led an outmigration of thousands of people into cities where indigenous identity has been challenged but not lost by the separation from homelands and also continues to provide a strong base of resistance. Reserves were also a strategy of spatial containment to isolate indigenous peoples to prevent united political action and to remove obstacles to white settlement and commercial interests. Today, the reserve system constitutes what Rob Nichols calls an archipelago of spatial containment that physically separates First Nations from Canadians, but also spatially differentiates their respective rights according to their relative access and relationship or their proximity and compliance to resources and infrastructure. So when Indigenous peoples disrupt de development or commodity flows, security responses by the state and law enforcement expose the way a space like the reserve or like a village settlement form part of the carceral state by providing a solution to that which exceeds state control via a spatial reorganization of populations from their lands into prisons. This dynamic of fixing populations in the midst of fluid and deterritorializing economies must be understood in the context of settler colonialism, where technologies of containment are not simply about building walls to keep people out, which we hear a lot about in terms of immigration discourse, but more precisely form a technology of separation and domination within an internal settler colonial occupation. The reserve prison circuitry is primarily about securing territorial jurisdiction where the state claims sovereignty but cannot exercise effective control. And I just really wanna offer my gratitude and respect to the Labrador land protectors for putting their bodies on the line in this context and for undertaking this kind of very intense forms of pacification. I don't want to take up too much more time, so I'll just kind of summarize um, these arguments. So the kind of security infrastructure that's grown up around this need to secure these vital extract sites of extraction has been dubbed uh, critical infrastructure, and there's a in critical infrastructure secretariat that's been created, that has relationships to CSIS, to the RCMP, to NRCAN, to Transport Canada, to border services. It's a multi-departmental approach to securing infrastructure. And there's a central concern and command for the RCMP in particular for, for policing indigenous protest, especially as it unfolds through what they call criminal acts committed, including quote, the blocking of major critical infrastructures such as railways and major highways. And two of the major critical infrastructure sectors prioritized are around energy and transportation, places in which indigenous people have made their presence felt when all other democratic channels have been closed. So for example, on January 5th alone, you can see the power of indigenous people to block these circulations of power during the height of the Idle No More, More movement on this one day alone, January 5th, 2013, these protests included five border crossing blockades. That's between the US and Canada, which is unprecedented as far as I know in Canadian history. Bridge blockades, rail line disruptions spanning the country. The railway blockades included Amgenong First Nation near Sarnia, Ontario, the Mi'kmaq from Listigush First Nation who blocked the railway in Quebec for several weeks. I'll end here by saying something that's new about this strategic shift. You know, I think that there's a connection between the way that um, 
colonialism has unfolded through the building of this major infrastructure and the extraction of resources from indigenous lands. But there is a policy shift that's important to pay attention to. And that's that the new resource extraction regime is designed to ensure on the face of it, a more equitable sharing of resource wealth through the redistribution of the resources collected. So what I mean by that is through land claim settlements that tie settlement to participation in the, in the local resource, through resource and revenue sharing agreements of other kinds, through access and benefit sharing agreements, all of these new forms of, or through equity partnerships and green energy, all of these new strategies of um, kind of policy capture um, to get social license to undertake these resource extraction projects are incredibly important to pay attention to because I think the government sees these as a way of mitigating its own liability in terms of seeing being seen as violating indigenous rights. So one of the first things that the Trudeau government was doing when it was preparing to bail out Kinder Morgan was to start setting up a First Nations consortium along the pipeline route and guaranteeing shares in the new pipeline in order to gain social license and in order to, to use that as a cover for all of the other indigenous groups who are virulently opposed to the pipeline. Um, so I guess I'll end by um, just reiterating how important, um, coming back to my point about capitalist development, not just being about a class war, but about you know galvanizing and using the kind of forces available. The resistance has come and has been most successful where other forms of kinship and alliance and togetherness and belonging and responsibility have been mobilized in order to provide a united front against these projects. And that's why I'm so honored to be here today. So thank you for having me.